Now, here's the journey of these bloodlines. You can pick it up at some point through history. It goes way back. Let's pick it up here. Um, these societies, these more advanced societies, Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, China, etc., they started to appear as the first more advanced societies uh, after the cataclysm. What history does is pick up uh, the, the cradle of civilization in places like Sumer and what have you. That wasn't the cradle of civilization. These societies were when human society had reached a certain point again after recovering from the great cataclysmic events that destroyed the previous society, much more advanced. Um, in this area of the world, Sumer, which is now, of course, Iraq, became Babylon, why there's so much Babylon symbolism uh, in human society today, Egypt. Um, a lot of the bloodlines uh, came from here, but they were seeded all over the world. And they talked about entities interbreeding with humans and creating uh, royal bloodlines and, and what have you in um, various uh, tablets found in, um, in Iraq, under, under Iraq in the last century or so. And these bloodlines moved out into northern Europe. They, they became the founders of Rome and they interbred with other bloodlines in Europe and they became the European royal families and aristocracy. And eventually, through the great British Empire, the French Empire, great only in size, by the way, in my view, uh, uh, and other European empires, they sent these bloodlines all over the world in the great colonial frenzy of uh, taking the planet over. Um, but there, there's two types of control. One has a finite life, one has an infinite life until it's exposed. The one that has a finite life is when you, like fascism, communism, uh, apartheid, that which is subject to the control can see the controllers. Because eventually, it might take some time, there will be a rebellion against that. The greatest form of control is control you can't see. Where they give you a vote every four or five years, and yet behind the scenes, the same people are in power behind the scenes all the time, no matter who's officially in power in, uh, in politics. And that's what they did in the colonial uh, system. They apparently withdrew back into their countries and gave independence to the former colonies like the United States and Canada and, and, and etc. around the world. But what they did was left out in those countries the bloodline under different names and the secret society network through which they manipulate the bloodline and its agents into power and they've gone on covertly controlling those countries um, ever since. And what they've created is a secret society and bloodline version of a transnational corporation. What uh, happens with a transnational corporation? Take McDonald's, please. Take, take McDonald's, if you, uh, if you will, as far as you can. Um, but take McDonald's as an example. They have a headquarters in America, and in each country they have subsidiaries. And the subsidiaries carry out the diktats of the headquarters and thus, if you go into a McDonald's in Russia or Australia or South Africa or wherever, you go into basically the same McDonald's. What they've done with the uh, Bloodline Global Network is they have a headquarters. Funnily enough, America is very, very influential, but the headquarters is in Europe. It's in places like the city of London, Rome, um, Brussels, Berlin, etc., uh, Paris. And from the center, they um, have subsidiaries in the different countries. These are subsidiary networks of bloodlines under different names and the secret society network um, within that country. And that network's um, uh, brief or job is to impose in their sphere of influence, their country, what is centrally dictated from the headquarters. Thus, as I've traveled around the world, I've seen the same things being introduced in, in different countries around the same time, often justified by the same excuses. And it even goes further, because the national um, network has subsidiaries in the towns, cities, and communities. And thus, um, from the headquarters, they can manipulate down into a local community, uh, if they wish, through this uh, network. Um, and they've created this structure in which they have not just infiltrated, but created the organizations that run uh, and control the direction of the world. I get into some of them. But what the vast, overwhelming majority of researchers into this conspiracy do not see, or do not want to go there, is the fact that there comes a point 
where this human network goes up into or out into other dimensions of reality and the dictating force is not human. And common themes. Uh, the number of times you see around the world depictions in different societies of half human, half reptile um, entities. This is in, uh, obviously in, uh, in Asia. And the depiction of the interaction between reptilian entities in humans and part human, part something else. The gargoyles on the, the churches built by these secret societies, like the Knights Templar, and on the castles and, and ma mansions of the uh, elite bloodlines, they are uh, symbolically uh, uh, these entities. Uh, so many of the coats of arms of these bloodlines uh, carry reptilian themes. Uh, the uh, whole logo of the city of London, or Babby London, as I call it, because it's one of the great central focuses of uh, control, uh, not, not only through finance either, um, is a reptilian holding the red cross and the white background of the Knights Templar, one of the major secret societies in this network. Uh, one of the key points in London, uh, for this conspiracy uh, anyway, where the city of London meets uh, Temple, or Temple Bar, or the Temple uh, region, which is the, the, the legal profession and courts, is this flying reptile um, on a pedestal right in the middle of the road. They put these things everywhere. Now there's another common theme, this is all over the world, of reptilian type entities eating humans. Um, there's so many of them, it's unbelievable. This is Central American, as the previous one was. Um, here's some more, and often they'll put a crown on the top because this is the royal bloodline. This is where the divine right to rule comes from, or the idea of it. It's the, it's the belief that you have the right to rule because of your genetic descendants from these gods, the divine right to rule. Uh, there again, a similar one. Here's uh, other ones and logos and coats of arms and, 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 and what have you. And there's Alfa Romeo, uh, uh, the same, and of course the red cross and the white background of the Knights Templar. You see this reptilian theme coming up a lot in, um, in entertainment because these bloodlines and their networks control Hollywood and they control uh, the entertainment industry in general. This is an advert, a Nike advert, where this American footballer was depicted as reptilian and the theme of it was because of that he was better than anybody else. Uh, and at the end of the thriller video, uh, when Michael Jackson turned around, they were reptilian eyes. They could have been lots of different eyes, but they were reptilian. And this happens because of what I said earlier, all these different things are worshipping the same basic uh, force and thus this symbolism of this force appears in all these different areas, not just these, also banking and politics and stuff. Now, a lot of these uh, bloodlines are Satanists, in fact the major ones are all Satanists. And by that I mean they are into human sacrifice, human blood drinking and all that, all this, all that other stuff, the sacrifice of children. And it's been going on way back. And people have no problem with the fact that it was going, oh yeah, those ancients used to do that, and the Aztecs and all that stuff. But they can't expand that perception of the possible that it's still going on. 